this is when we set the tone for the entire movie. If we nail them on Bohemian Rhapsody, we got them for the rest of the movie. I think it's the perfect song to open that movie. I see a little silhouette of a man. Scaramouche, Scaramouche, will you do the fandango? Thunderbolts and lightning, very, very frightening me. I think we've all been in a car full of idiots, you know, drinking beer and just blasting a radio, you know. It just reminds you of when you were um, a teenager and, like, didn't have any problems. It's such a great song, you know, with all the different parts to it. I decided what I would do is make the guys sit in the car and just bang their heads, like, really a lot. Like, da 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 I mean, and seeing all those guys bobbing their heads like that, that was absolutely classic. I went to that movie four times just to see that scene again. This is probably one of the most odd rock songs ever written, Bohemian Rhapsody. We shot it in a small town in California late at night with the car driving around. We really didn't rehearse the scene until the night before. You didn't actually hear Queen when they were driving down. You just heard these five semi-drunken guys going, you know, Beelzebub as a devil is I and started screaming. It is difficult to sit there and, and move your head like that over and over and over again. And we must have done it like 40, 50 times. And I'm sure there was some chiropractic work that was needed afterwards. Mike Myers got a headache, he said, and he had to stop. His neck hurt him so badly. And I was freaking out because I'm like, oh, Mike, come on, man, just take some more aspirin because we really have to keep shooting. Yeah, yeah, that's good, that's good. More head bobbing. We need more head bobbing. And get out and walk around in the parking lot and go, I can't do this anymore. And then he would go, and besides, it's not funny. What are we going to do? It's not funny. This is, like, stupid. I'm like, trust me, it's funny. <laughs> not real. People don't do that. Yes, they do, Mike. They really do that. They sit in the car like that, and they bang their heads. I understand why it would hurt. Mike Myers wasn't used to it. Mike, I'm sorry you had a headache, honey. Hmm. Hear those first strains of the piano and waves goodbye the circus is leaving town it's just beautiful Ballerina, you must have they had just gone through this wacky evening the night before now russell hammond goes off on an acid binge they pick up the singer wrapped in a blanket like a wet cat you can cut it with a knife when russell walks onto that bus so it blew me away. Having that band come back together through song. Probably about 2 o'clock in the morning one night, Cameron called me where I was in Europe and said I'd like you to be a part of my movie. And three weeks later, I was here and, uh, doing rehearsals for, for Almost Famous. Cameron Crowe has always been really into music, and he used to write for, of course, Rolling Stone back in the day. And I thought, oh my god, I've never been in a movie. I'm going to be hanging out with these actors. And I remember feeling really nervous about it. I was really shy about acting. I was the guy that wasn't shy about singing. Cameron saw that, and I think that he thought, well, that's the way to break the ice on this scene, is to have Mark, who, who is the singer in the bunch, open the scene up. Cameron was letting me be in the spotlight a little bit. And then tickets out for gone. Cameron watched me for three or four months struggling to fit into this acting role. I think he, he was just finally like, let Mark relax and let's and let him sing and do what he does. He makes a stand in the auditorium. For a brief second there, they remembered why they had a band in the first place. I have to go home. One reason music matters is because it never lets you down, and that's what that whole vibe was in that film. I would have felt huge pressure to have inspired him enough to knock him off his writer's block. If I had told him the song was no good, he'd probably never write again. And I'd give up forever to touch you, because I'm 
know that you feel me somehow You're the closest to heaven that I'll ever be And I don't want to go home right now And all I could taste is this moment And all I can breathe is your life My wife and I split up and I came out here and was kind of living in a hotel. I really had been kicking myself trying to find the perfect piece of music to really sum up this, this sort of intimate quest of Nick Cage's in the picture, which is to dare to make the leap into the unknown and to dare to hope that Meg Ryan's going to open the door for him. And in one screening, uh, John Resnick showed up with, with some of his gang from uh, the Goo Goo Dolls. I was not liking anything that I was writing. You bring them in, you leave them alone with your movie. I called a real estate agent. I was trying to find a bomb shelter, you know, that I could that I could go and work in. You know, just close the door in this sort of subterranean thing where nobody would hear. I only knew about John Resnick's tanking writer's block after the fact. I was not writing a lot, and I, I had started feeling like everything I wrote sucked. He had been told nothing about, you know, here's a slot, here's a, here's a need. He just went and wrote Iris. Got the gears turning in my head and said, you know, what would I say if I was this guy? And This song had to reinvest the audience in the stakes, say for Nick what he couldn't say himself. Went back to the hotel and wrote it on a four-string guitar. <laughs> Took it back to Danny. And he sits down as if, like, he's an actress on an audition. And sits down and starts to play this acoustic guitar. And in the first verse, the string breaks. I fully expected him to go, what are you, crazy? Get out of here with that. I just go, man, I think this could be the one for us. Iris fit perfectly with the one sequence that I needed. I think that song wound up becoming the biggest hit off the record. And, uh, you know, I had never anticipated that or expected that. It's incredibly moving and reaches you. It completely grabs you, and you're with Nick Cage. You're feeling what he's feeling in a really powerful way. I think I managed to latch on to something in that movie, you know, and got lucky and said the right words at the right time. And I don't want to...